Bless you. You know, the, the, you talked about Baldu. I, I remember when I was when I was uh, doing those uh, LBTV shows for TV40, and um, we had set up for Baldu to, to interview Molly Hatchet. Well, the guy that I had that was the, you know, I was behind the scenes, the guy that I had to interview these people, um, went to the concert with me. He got just loaded, just blitzed. So we, and they're, they're backstage basically with their bus. You know, okay. we went back to their bus, and he goes up, he goes, ha, and he falls over, flat, flat on his face. He didn't fall backwards, he fell flat on his face, you know. So I ended up saying, okay, camera, just point it to, at this group, and I'll do the interview real <laughs> quick, you know. Like, it, was, it was like, these guys are looking at him like, he's just, yeah, here on the, on the ground, you know. He, he was just blasted. It was amazing. Cause, you know, we got free drinks. You know, they were giving us free drinks, and it's like he went a little crazy. So when was this? What what when was this? What year would that have been? Oh, geez, that would have been. That would have been right around early nineties. I would it's think. It's yeah. funny you mentioned the bus because um, Molly Hatchet played one of our fireworks displays one Fourth of July. I want to say it was in the early two thousands, and. Where we where they did the fireworks is down on the Ohio River, and there's a thing called the Serpentine Wall, and it's kind of a wall that kind of snakes back and forth. And in these areas where it's kind of concave is a flat part. And if the river's low enough, you usually did you, you put the concert kind of down in that little bowl area there. Yeah. And um, trying to get vehicles down there can be a little tricky because depending on where the water level is, Molly Hatchet insisted that they get their bus right behind the stage. <laughs> now the stage. I mean, the stage was no more than 20 feet from the right, water. Right. They somehow got that bus down there and behind the stage. And I don't know if that was something they just automatically always did. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was that, and uh, I, I, I just remember, I remember getting there because I was supposed to do a little shift before that, just broadcasting um, this and that. And uh, I just remember like, what, what's the, what's behind the. What's behind the, the, the stage here? Oh, that's that's uh, Molly Hatchet's bus. Yeah. Their bus? Yeah, they said they, they have to have it behind the stage. Really? Yeah, Molly Hatchet. I mean, I love Molly Hatchet. I love, yeah. I love the music, but they, they were a little bit... Were they? They were a little bit like, <laughs> we are really important people, you know. So. Which, when I think about it, Molly Hatchet doesn't rise to that no. level of... No, no, no that's... No. And then I tell you, the nicest... They have great album covers. Yes. <laughs> the nicest person that I ever met in the whole wide world when it came to entertainers was when, and this is one great thing about being an MUS that I was totally blown away with. I went to the country music, is it radio? Yeah. They bring the radio stations in every year. They, oh, yeah, yeah. Down yeah, to yeah. Nashville. Yeah. I don't know what they call that. Yeah, I, I was never so... Well, I got to go yeah. with Dixon and somebody else. And... Um, I thought this was going to be stupid. I thought this was going to be the dumbest. I was like, oh, crap, i got to go along. Yeah. I hate country music and all this stuff. And at the time, I actually didn't ha I didn't really hate country music because Shania Twain had just come on. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of uh, Mutt Lang, who produces all of the, you know, ACDC and Def right, Leppard. Right. So I was loving what he was doing with, with Shania. And the music was getting, hey, this is kind of cool music. We get, they have, they have these sessions down there where you can have artists record liners for you. Okay. And, it, and it's in a big room, and they're kind of sitting in these little cubicles separated by, you know, dividers. And you bring your little, you know, your little player, recorder, whatever you have, and you sit down. So I get in there, and I, I see a couple of short lines, so I just get into short lines, and, and you know, I introduce myself and whoever the artist is. And, and they're like, you know, okay, yeah, yeah 107 MUS, and, you know, they're saying what they say, and they record it. I'm like, hey, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's, you know. The, there's a really, really long line, and I can't quite figure out what, who's 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 off this. So I go, I kind of walk around, and it's Garth Brooks. Oh, okay. And this line is enormous. I must have stood in that line for two hours. So, and I'm trying, I'm trying to think, what is taking so long? What the heck is he doing? So as we get closer, of course, I'm tall enough to look over a lot of people, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I see that every single time somebody comes up, he stands up. He introduces himself, shakes your hand, he he, asks, he offers you to sit down if, you, if you'd like, yeah. which you're gonna, and then he talks to you, like where are you from, what are you doing, you know, and, and uh, you know what, what do you think of you know, just just having a chit chat. He said, do you need me to record some stuff? Yeah, he records some stuff. And he goes, do you need me to record anything else? 
well, not, not really. Do you mind if I do a couple of just things off the top of my head? <laughs> That'd be great. Did you record that? And he says, okay, I think I think that's is that, is that good? And of course, the person is just, you know, they just everybody's just like kind of like froze up. They can't believe it. Yeah. And then he says, okay, well, you know, thank you. Thank, he stands up again and he thanks them. And then, then the next person comes up and this whole thing starts over again. Yeah. And I'm like, holy crap. Is, there's, there's no way he does that for every single person. So I'm standing there in line with my little recorder. By golly, I get up, that, get up there, and if he didn't do that same thing, and, and I mean, I could have, we could have talked for a half an hour. Yeah. He was, he was, and I, thought, I think they I thought he was going to say, you don't like country, do you? <laughs> no, he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he just asked me, like, what do you do? And I said, well, I work at the radio station, and, you know, I make imaging, and I'm going to take these things and make sweepers out of them. And he says, oh, yeah, 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 that's, that's, the, that's what you, yeah, I've, obviously I've been doing a long line. Of those. Yeah, your line is incredible. And he goes, I know. He said, I don't know, kind of kind of feel bad for the other <laughs> the other people, I, so like, well, I think I know why it's so long. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, he was just really uh, kind of a nice, uh, down to earth guy. And then there's a special out right now, I think, on Netflix. Yeah, I see. It. Have I you seen that it, thing? Yeah, yeah. And he's he's totally different now than he was then. Yeah. Because he looks like a lot. He's a lot more intense and introspective. Yeah, and, yeah. And than he was then. He just was a nice guy. So I don't know if that was in him at the time, but I was really surprised to see that special because I thought, well, that's yeah, I, I, I turned it off. It was kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, it was. I watched the whole thing, but I was like, what is this? He's really... Yeah, I don't really like, I don't really want to hear your advice. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> he's just... He's, he's all these deep... It's, you're too deep, dude. You yeah, just, yeah, You know, yeah. gosh, you're, you're rich. Um, just, you know... And, and he's telling his... Like, they're, they're having that meeting with the musicians, and he's like, okay, now remember, when you're on the stage, this is the biggest thing... Yeah, yeah, you've worked with these guys for how long? Right, right. You need to really tell these dudes yeah. that that's you know that that's kind of what what you're going to be walking into. I mean, I would think everybody would kind of yeah. know that by now. But yeah, he was by far the the guy that gave the most. And what I really learned from it was <laughs> when we were at Sunny FM, we'd have bands stop by like Trickster and all these little teeny weeny yeah. bands, and yeah. they were always just just dicks. Oh really? All the, all of them were. They just yeah. thought they were hot snot. They didn't want to record anything. They didn't want to be on the air. They they just didn't want to. They just didn't want to do anything. And they just thought that they were just the hottest things ever. And what I learned from country music was is that the artists in country music really understood how valuable radio was to them. Right. Where the other guys, they didn't get it. Yeah. They they, they and they could care less. But the country folks, every artist I talked to. They were just unbelievably nice yeah. and gracious, and way more appreciative of the radio people than I thought we were, than I thought we deserved. But yeah. that's what I that's what I learned about when that was the that was a great thing about the MUS experience was being able to do that yeah. and like experiencing that because I, I would have I never had experienced being with entertainers in that way at an event kind of like that. Usually in the studio it was a different story, but but you know when you had them kind of an event where they're kind of yeah. turned on and all that. So I, that, that that really impressed me well, the, about the, that. As far as country goes, the first time I worked at MUS was, uh, um, I think it was right, was it right before Sunny? No, it was right after Sunny, which was 80, 89, 90. It was 90. Okay. And uh, the first concert I got to go to with MUS was, was George Jones, Vince Gill, and Conway Twitty. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. They're all three, and then George Jones started the thing because he said, you know, he's no show Jones, so he <laughs> wanted to start to make sure everybody knew he was going to show. But yeah, I got to talk to George Jones. He was my idol. I mean, I just, oh, no I kidding. just thought, oh, yeah, George. And then Vince Gill, that was when he was just getting started, and I couldn't believe the guitar stuff he was doing, you know. And then, of course, he was with Pure Prairie League. And right. Stuff to talk to him. I didn't get to talk to Conway. Conway wouldn't talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, not too much longer after that he passed away. Right. But anyway, but uh, I got to tell you, um, when I was at the Hilton, you know, all these acts would do their thing at either Prolenthal or LC. Okay. And they'd stay at the Hilton. Well, um, I, you know, I saw like Frank Zappa, and he was just real strange. He <laughs> didn't mind signing the women's breast, but that was about <laughs> it. You know. And then... We had, um, you know, Kiss was in there, and they were in their party, and, and when Kiss was there, it was the same, I guess Ted Nugent was the opening. You know, okay. Some form. And he was just picking women up and driving them off in his vet, you know, back and forth, you know. <laughs> but the one guy I felt sorry for, I don't know if you remember Richard Marks? Yes. 
we had a, a code at the at the lounge. You had to have a collared shirt, or you couldn't get in. Well, Richard didn't have any collared shirts, so he, they would not let him in the. And so here he is sitting in the lobby. You know, people are coming in kind of like looking like, hey, I'm Richard Marks, you know. <laughs> you know yeah. who I am, you know. And, no, but he can't. sat there, you know, waiting to talk to somebody, you know. I oh felt bad for the guy. God. But, uh, and then the monkeys, oh, that was my first, my first and last um, autograph because I asked Mickey Dolan's, I said, you know, I was at, at Rock 95 at the time, I said, can you sign... And it was uh, that what was then this is now remember that mm -hmm. yeah they came out with that after all those years and we were playing it and I said well you know we assigned to all the guys at Rock ninety five so he writes something down and I look at it it's like what the hell does that say <laughs> you know it's good. it did it didn't say anything you know it was a couple of little scribbles on there so it's like well forget about the autograph I'll just <laughs> see these guys yeah I was never big in, the, in the getting autographs either uh, yeah. I've got a friend uh, Dave Savage who insists that he has to get a photograph with yeah. every single, and he has got, and, and, and Dave Savage is like my size, and, and he's just goofy looking, he's just goofy looking. In fact, if if he asked you to take a photo, you would actually, your your first thought would be like, oh, I don't know if I really want to, <laughs> I don't know if I really, I mean, and, but he, he's got a photograph with everybody, and it's it's uh, it's so funny. The only photographs that I have, in fact, it was, it was funny, I was looking through them the other day, um, I got a photograph with uh, the Subway Sandwich guy. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, boing. Yeah. Um, you know, I got one with, uh, uh, you know, Jerry Springer and things of that sort. I don't have any, like, you know, super-duper uh, famous people. And, and usually the people I get a photograph with usually end up getting arrested for some sort of... <laughs> <laughs> some, sort of, some sort of some sort of thing. So yeah, I was never uh, never uh, never into that. Yeah, that I, don't think that. Thing. I didn't take any photographs. The, 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 I wish I had. Yeah, me too. Me too. Really. Just yeah. I can talk about it. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Sure, <laughs> sure, you met Frank Zappa. Yeah, I'm sure you did. Oh, he signed your breast, Frank. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tore my shirt off and he signed it. <laughs> but the the three people that I've actually I actually interviewed. Well, Mitch Ryder was kind of fun because he was in a, in a pool spending time with his kids during the divorce. But anyway, <laughs> and uh, but uh, Estelle Harris, remember who she was? She was the mother of George on Seinfeld. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was the nicest woman ever. No kidding. Oh, I loved her. Yeah, she was just great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because I, I, she plays such a she does. mean old yes. person on Seinfeld, you know. And then uh, the... the Lead singer and drummer, he's passed away now, but uh, from the grassroots, and I can't I can't remember his name, but he was he was awesome. But Randy Bachman, now Randy Bachman, you would think that because you know he was with, of course, the Who, right? Guess who, rather? Yeah. And supposedly, you know, they couldn't get they those two couldn't get along, and he got away from the group, and he went with BTO. Well, supposedly couldn't get along with the guy the guys in BTO, and you know went off on his own. He was the nicest guy ever. He talk, we talked for probably a good hour and a half. I mean, it was the most boring interview ever, but I was, you know. No kidding. I'm a big, yeah. you know, BTO fan and Guess Who fan. Huh. And um, he sent me all his CDs that he had been recording in his garage studio, you know. And for some reason, I don't have them now. I don't know. I mean, I probably sold them on eBay or something. But, uh, yeah, this guy just went on forever just talking about different things. I'd ask him questions and... You know, talking about just gigging with Neil Young and just stuff like that. It was, it was kind of cool. Wow. It, was, it was pretty cool. My first my first run-in with somebody famous was uh, uh, when I was at that little station in Cadillac. Um, I got, they had, for some reason, they had backstage passes to Rick Springfield. Oh, there you go. And at the time, I was kind of a Rick Springfield. This was right after uh, Jesse's Girl Jesse's came out. Yeah, everybody And I think the song. second album, I think he was touring for the second album now. And... Um, of course, he was on TV and all of that, and I thought, man, you know, if I could look like him, that would be sweet. <laughs> so I get these backstage passes, and I've got a girlfriend at the time, and we go up to the castle in Charlevoix. Okay. Okay. So, and I've never been, really never been out of Cadillac at that time, so even just leaving the town was kind of a huge deal. We drove up there, and, and I got parked, and I got backstage with my pass, and all of a sudden my girlfriend... We found out that we didn't have we had backstage passes, but we didn't have tickets to the show. Oh, which I geez. thought I thought backstage passes yeah. meant tickets, yeah. but apparently it doesn't always mean that way. So I'm like, wow, well, I guess we're just going to have to stay back. I wonder if I can get on the stage, you know, like on the side, maybe. 
So, and it, while I'm thinking about that, and of course I'm, what, I'm 17, 18, I have no idea what I'm doing anyways, um, my girlfriend says she has to go to the bathroom. And of course, we're backstage, and you really can't, and, and for some reason, they must have had everything set up, because there was nobody back there. Yeah. Not even walking around, nothing. I think right. everything was all set up. So, we just start walking through, they've got these little buildings back there that kind of look like castles. <laughs> and we're just kind of walking through looking for a bathroom. And we come around this corner, and Rick Springfield is standing in the hallway talking to somebody. Now, my girlfriend really doesn't have any idea who he is. Okay. So she just kind of walks right up to him. Excuse me, sir. Um, could you tell me where the bathroom is? <laughs> oh, my God. And he's like, uh, yeah, it's, you know, I think it's just kind of down there to the right and whatever. And uh, she's like, okay, thanks. And off she goes. And I'm just standing there like, man, it's pretty big. Holy crap. And he, he uh, talk, finishes with whoever he's talking with. And uh, he turns to me and he goes like, so it's like, do you have to go too? And I'm like, nah, no, no, I don't, I don't have to go. And I said, uh, I said, you're Rick Springfield. <laughs> he goes, yes, I am, I am. And uh, he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I, you know, I work for a radio station. And he's like, yeah, come with me for a second. And we go down the hallway just a little ways and into his dressing room. Now, you remember the dog on the on the covers? Oh yeah, yeah. That, he had that dog with him. <laughs> and so I was petting his dog, and we, ju we just, he just asked me a bunch of questions about what I'm doing, and. And all of that, and uh, and uh, then my girlfriend came back, and we must have talked for, gee, it must have been 10, 15 minutes. Wow. Um, he was the nicest, he was the, kind of the nicest guy and, and all of that. I wish I had told him I didn't have tickets, because maybe he could have uh, could have got me uh, got me some yeah, tickets. Yeah, but yeah. I, I was just like, oh, man, I can't really, you know, I'm talking to Rick Springfield and that. Right. And I knew a little bit about his, about his background and, and all of that, so I was kind of asking him a few questions and, and all of that. I've seen since then, he does a tour, uh, a, a, a cruise, oh, like really? a yearly cruise where you go... On a cruise with Oh, yeah, Rick yeah, I, I've seen that. It was like, like not a carnival, but it's a, some kind of a 70s, yeah, and there was 80s a, cruise. And there was a like show that. that they sort of filmed yeah, him. Yeah. And um, he looks like he really takes to, he, it, it looks like he just, anybody, there was a kid that could play, like, songs. And he had, had the kid come up and play with him. And he just, you know, whatever the kid started playing, he would just kind of join. But it looked like he was, he's very accessible to yeah. just people kind of coming up. And, and that's thats something I didn't know about that. I, I wish artists would do that more, would sort of show themselves, kind of just them being them and, and all that. I think well, there was a the, happy actor on a soap opera, too. Yes, it? at that time he was, yeah. yeah. It was it was kind of a huge deal. It was so funny, my girlfriend had no idea. Yeah, and, uh, it's like, like, oh, like, you, you, you know who you asked where the bathroom was? No. <laughs> That's the guy we came to say. <laughs> it is? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, obviously, that wasn't a match made in heaven. No, I guess, <laughs> guess. I thought for sure I would lose her to him. That's, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, maybe I got, maybe I got a shot here. I don't know. She ended up being, um, ended up being Miss Wexford County. Oh, there you in go. In 1983. And then she dumped me. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a mullet then? Oh, um, no, I, no. You had the I, best mullet ever. That was that was the thing. You def, definitely had the best mullet. So. I actually, and I didn't think it was that great. I wanted it to be even bigger and better. I thought that with that Billy Ray Cyrus was working on, yeah, that was a mullet. But yeah. um, my mullet went to a whole new. Let's see, uh, it wasn't as. I wish I had more of a mullet. I was actually disappointed with. So thank you for that. But it wasn't as good as I really wanted it to be. But in '96, I got a photograph of myself. Just after I got to that station in there, where, where the hair is, is kind of oh, really? coming, it's kind of curling off the, the back Being of Marlowe Thomas. It just, just, it just, it looks. Oh. You were that girl. I was, you know, I'm standing, you know, got, got my, got my fox shirt on, and I'm kind of, you know, you know like I thought I was, you know, hey man, I'm on the fox. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw a picture the other day of myself when I was uh, DJing somewhere, and I had the mullet, and I'm thinking, man, I really thought that looked good too. Really There's good. some photos that Jeannie has of me. Oh yeah, of me. In there. I'm signing. I, I, we're at a we're at a Beach Boy concert thing. Yeah, and, and yeah. I'm wearing these shorts that are like. Yeah. They are so short. Sure. Like, yeah. And I got my my socks are pulled up to my knee. Yeah. What am I doing? That was the eighties. Yeah. Why didn't yeah. somebody <laughs> sit me down? <laughs> what are you doing? Oh my god, it was so ridiculous. I do remember signing up. We were signing up people. It was like whoever had the best like con like poster. That mentioned the Beach yeah. Boys in our radio station. Yeah, those which, pictures are in there. Yeah. Are they okay? Oh, yeah. yeah, and I just, I just, I look at them like, God, those shorts. What am I doing? Yeah. And that's back when I was, I think I'd just gotten out of the army, and I was so thin. 
Oh yeah, the army had taken me from. I was I was I was probably you know I probably wasn't this size, but I was really big. I went from I think I went from like 215 down to 187. There's a photograph of me at home in between um, basic training and going to permanent party in in, uh, in Germany, where it looks like like if you didn't notice I was sitting in my bed, you could have sworn I I'd been like in Vietnam in some sort of like uh, you know bamboo cage being being <laughs> being uh, you know starved to death. I was like holy smokes. Um, but that whole um, army experience uh, really did wonders for my radio career yeah. in a weird way. Um, first of all, it gave me um, some interesting stories to tell because the army is just that's that's kind of like it's kind of like Animal House on steroids. It's just when I was there, there was nothing going on, so it was just just a bunch of goofy guys doing goofy stuff. But it really changed me as a person. Um, basic training that eight weeks, and I want to say there's about maybe three weeks in there where I went from a guy that I didn't really like very much myself to like, oh, hey, you know, it really, it really changed me and really knocked me out of whatever groove I was in. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't, uh, people always ask me that, you know, oh, that must have been, you must have been bummed out when your parents kicked you out. And I go like, it was the best thing that ever happened. Yeah. I probably would be still living with my parents today <laughs> if they hadn't done that. Um, but that was, that was an interesting experience. And uh, that was that was I think that also helped me with the radio because when I got when I got to Sunny, you know, I was the midday guy and then also the production director. Um, but I would I would do anything. I would I sort of I had this mentality where it was like you're part of a team. If there's a hole that needs to be filled, fill it. Yeah. No matter what it was. And so I would I, I would just I would just do anything and the army taught me, you know, like, you know, you do it until you drop. That was that was normal. And uh it would I don't know if I would have been the same person in radio if I hadn't right. hadn't hadn't had that experience. Um we well, definitely took charge when you were there to let people know that, you know. You acted like you knew what you were doing. I, well, and I, that, I think that's part of the act. I mean, it was like, well, I, and if I didn't know what I was doing, act like you do. Yeah. Cause, uh, and, uh, and it was actually kind of easy because nobody else wanted to do commercial production. So it, I don't know why I actually acted like I knew what I was doing because I didn't really have to because nobody else wanted to do it. Yeah, um, well, see, if I would have known that, I would have been out. Like, <laughs> you help. I loved it. I, uh, yeah, I couldn't get enough of it either. We were in we were in Wiesbaden, which is basically 13 miles west of Frankfurt, and we were in an old SS camp, an old German SS camp yeah. um, base, in the middle of, of the city on the top of this hill. So there was like neighborhoods around us, yeah. and we were in this barrack area. And I worked for a basically it was a Lance missile, and at the time it was about it was a 21 foot missile that you'd launched off of this little tank thing, and uh, and I actually worked for there was there was a there were they called them batteries and there were five batteries in a battalion and there was uh, there was three batteries that did all the firing and they trained like nobody I mean that's all they did was just train train there was headquarters battery that did all the uh, paperwork for the for that and then I was in service battery which I was, we were supposed to service what everybody else was doing but it basically was you did nothing all day long <laughs> and so we just goofed around I mean. We just goofed around the whole time, and and luckily I had befriended somebody in basic training. And I don't think if I had him as a friend, basic training would have been that much fun. But he and I, he was from North Carolina, huge Southern draw, kind of a short, fat guy, funny as hell. We laughed. I did more push-ups for laughing in basic training than for anything else. We were just laughing all the time, and and the reason we were laughing was because the drill sergeants. When I was in there in, in eighty, they were mean, but they weren't allowed to like hit you or, or you know they, but they would mentally try to mess with you, and but most of the time, when they mentally tried to mess with you, I found it funny. In fact, when people yell at me now, if I ever really get yelled at, I immediately start laughing because yeah. I just cannot believe that somebody's in my face. It's brought to such anger that they think yelling at, at me is gonna gonna work. Yeah. So I usually just laugh. Um, 
And so the drill sergeant would, they would, they figured it out that he and I would usually laugh at everything they were doing because we had kind of figured out that, okay, as long as you can do everything physically, the rest of it's just a mental game. And if you can put up with all the nonsense that they're going to put you through because it's supposed to simulate, you know, the kind of combat situation that you might be in, so they're just going to mentally try to torture you to, to, to make you snap. And if you don't snap, you're going to be fine. Well, we figured that out pretty quick. So they would start terrorizing us mentally, and, it was, it was, and they always found the funniest things to do. And then the other guys that didn't get it, we would start laughing at them. One of my favorite things that happened was we were in the middle of this field. Basic training was in Oklahoma. And basically, I think there's only two trees in Oklahoma. There's one way over there, and there's one way over there. And there was a bunch of sandbags around one, and he gets us, he marches us out into the field. We're going to do something. I don't know what it would be. Whatever we were going to do, it always was the most important thing in the whole world, which it wasn't. And he starts telling us, okay, men, we're going to start doing this, and we're, what are all those sandbags doing over there? Those aren't supposed to be underneath that tree. They're supposed to be underneath that tree. You guys... Grab a sandbag and get over there. And, it, and, and so I think we had to make like three trips. So we're running with these big, heavy sandbags. And, of course, right away I tell Stephen, what do you think we're doing for the rest of the day? Yeah. Stephen's like, I think we know. London is running. He's like, I can't wait for us to get these sandbags over that tree because then once we get over there, we're done with that. And of course, we get the sandbags over to that tree. Let's be out of the tree. He starts talking to us, and he's like, what are those sandbags doing it? Everybody grab a sandbag. And London's like, I can't believe we're doing this all day long. So we would, <laughs> that's kind of the stuff that we would just, you know, we would just find it funny as hell. And, uh, and then uh, permanent party, since we were in that SSS, that SS camp, um, and a lot of the German people didn't like us there, but there was a, our military presence back in the 80s was unbelievable. The amount of military people in Germany back then was mind-boggling. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't walk two steps without running into somebody that's in the military in that place. So across the street was this big mansion with a great big giant field. And one day they were having some kind of a festival, and of course the beer's flowing, and you would you would buy these yeah. pint, the huge yeah. and thick glass. You would buy the the glass, and then you would they would charge you then for that, and you just kind of carry that thing around. So we're we're walking on drinking. And we come up to this area where this guy is standing, and he's he's standing in front of something that we kind of recognize, but we don't really. It's like a banner of some kind, and he's yelling in German about something. People are like going, "Yes!" You know, and they're all just yelling. We're in the back, and we're standing there. And I'm like, "Hey, Stephen, that thing he's standing in front of it doesn't that, that kind of look like our missile?" <laughs> he's like, "Yeah, kind of does." And our missile, we could you, you could attach. What five or six different kind of warheads to it? Anything from just a normal conventional bomb to mustard gas, nerve agent, or even nukes. And there were there were there were you could dial a nuke in. It was it was like low, medium, and high. You could you could set a little lever for it to explode. So anyways, it kind of had a nuke sign on it. And so they were protesting basically us. Oh, okay. You know, kind of drinking there. And I remember we're standing there, and, and we're you know we're really really just messed up. And I remember as we're standing there, the people in front of us are kind of like, they kind of stand and kind of look at us like, what are you guys doing? And then the people in front of them. And within a matter of maybe two minutes, just about everybody in this whole thing <laughs> were, were turned kind of staring at us like, what are you two standing there looking at? And I'm like, you know, we might, we might want to go, Stephen. It's, it's, it's <laughs> so that was, and then the other thing that happened was there was, there was a bombing in Berlin. And a bunch of uh, military guys were in this discotheque. The bomb went off, and some people, some military people died. And they put us on alert, which basically meant you patrolled the perimeter of this little base. And it was you were on two hours and off four hours for a total of seven days. And it sucked. Yeah. And they first sent us out with our rifles with ammunition. And then every third guy had a radio, too, that you could just kind of radio in. So we're patrolling the thing. Somebody accidentally fires off a round. So they send us out the next time with no ammunition, but we still have the guns. Kids are coming home from school, and they're laughing at us through the fence. Hey, you know, little German kids. Some guy points his weapon at the kid 
and pulls the trigger, of course there's no ammo, but the, there's the click. The parents in this neighborhood freak out. Yeah. You know, so now they take our weapons away. Now we're supposedly supposed to be on alert, right? <laughs> so they hand us baseball bats. Yeah. Yeah. Wooden ones. So you'd go out with a baseball bat, but you'd come back with like a toothpick because you were banging the bat on everything. <laughs> so then they took the bats away, so we had nothing. So every third guy had a radio, and that was it. So if anybody was coming through the gate, I guess you were supposed to yell <laughs> at that. So we turned that into how much stuff could we take out on guard duty that we weren't supposed to take out on guard duty? How much, like how much beer, yeah. food, cigar, whatever we could find. And the rule was, is everybody who went out on guard duty had to wear the exact same thing. You could wear shorts, as long as everybody was wearing shorts, but it was winter time. So we had this cold weather gear, but then we had this like extreme cold weather gear where the jackets were just huge and the boots were, in fact, you wore this, you, you, you pretty much would sweat to death. Yeah. But, so we would try to sneak out stuff. And I remember the first time we did cold weather, I think I snuck out a beer. And then we, we were like, eh, we got the beer. And we would, what we would do is we would meet up and drink the beer while we were on guard duty. And then we'd eat and smoke cigars and, you know, just kind of goof around and not do what we we're supposed to be doing. My friend goes, listen, let's go with the extreme gear and let's see if we can't bring out a 12 pack of bottles. They're going to clink in the, you know, how are we going to do this? So we put, you know, six beers in each and, and food. And we're just out to here with just what we have. And we had to march in formation. And I remember trying to march without the bottles clinking together. <laughs> but you could hear clink, 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 clink. And we did. We drank we drank a, a whole bunch. I came back just just blitz out of my mind. <laughs> but that was the best thing about the Army is that the, their, their slogan at the time was, we do more before 9 o'clock than most people do all day. We change it to we do more stupid things before nine o'clock than most people do in a whole lifetime, and that was true. We did a lot of yeah. really dumb, dumb things, but it, but I kind of got that out of my system. So when I came back, I was focused and ready to yeah. ready to get going, and I, that was a real good thing for me. And then of course, you know, like like you witnessed, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, act like you do. Yeah. And uh, so that's what I kind of did until I until I think I figured it out. Yeah. So that was. That was, and at that time, you know, I really, I was really faking it good. If you, if that was '89, yeah, I was. It was about 99% faking it, and yeah. 1% knowing what you were doing oh, yeah. at that point. Yeah, that was. But you always had a positive attitude, though. I remember that. Is uh, yeah. Yeah, I was. I, I, I loved it. I just couldn't believe I was there either, too. On top of it. I wish I used like to have a an old uh, EHS camera back then. Nice to videotape all the stuff that we did, like the hands on boat and all that stuff. Oh, okay. But my my kids decided to record over those tapes <laughs> for you know He Man or something. So yeah, so much for all that good yeah. stuff. I did have I did have some some stuff that I found that I did with Joe. As far as when he he got the full face full massage and yep. facial thing at uh, Peggy White Nights and and uh, I did have some too that when he uh, was down at the beach and we brought an Elvis. In person, <laughs> he was great, man. He could just do it, just follow right along and do whatever, you know. Yeah, that was he never missed a beat. He I, never I, missed a beat. You know, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got my uh, demo tapes. I've got a commercial demo tape and an air check demo tape from that from that Sunny FM era that I listen to every now and then. I'm always surprised. Um, at how good some of the stuff actually turned out, yeah, yeah, and I'm also too. surprised at how shockingly horrible yeah. some of it is. But I'm always like, wow! I mean, there was there was some stuff that we did uh, on the air, and then also some stuff I did in the studio that I was like, wow! Yeah. You know, that's sometimes I go like, wow, you really haven't progressed much further than you did when you first started. Yeah. <laughs> that's really true. Funny if that was some of my best stuff that I ever did. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. It was. Uh, but she would, gosh, she would pull stuff out of, I mean, I don't remember anybody saying anything to the effect of like, hey, uh, we're not going to be able to pull this off because we couldn't get right. this or that. She or made it happen. She made it every single time. I mean, there was even a point where we were, was it bovine bingo? And we were dropping, we were dropping stuff out of helicopters. Right. I don't know where you get a helicopter, but she <laughs> somehow got a helicopter. Um, 
Yeah, there was a lot of, and there was also, there's also a lot of stuff I don't know because I was stuck back in the studio. So that's why watching these videos is kind of neat because I'm finding out, you know, oh, wow, that happened? Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, what these larger companies are doing to themselves yeah. is just, you know. They're um, destroying radio. Oh, it's just, you know. In <laughs> fact, they, yeah, you know, they, they, they really are. And we went through, so when I got down to Cincinnati, it was j And when... President uh, Clinton and the FCC released the restrictions on how many radio stations you could buy in a market. It used to be you could only own an FM and an AM, and that was it. Right. Well, they, they said you can buy whatever you want to. Well, JCOR went on this buying spree, um, and Randy Michaels, who was a consultant of Sunny FM, I think that's why. I remember that. Name, yeah, yeah, I think Randy Randy is a big shot down in down in Cincinnati. Um, also, Randy was part of the uh, the Power Pig. If you remember that down in Tampa, no, um, no, but okay. Yeah, okay. There's, but there was this. It was this station that came in um, and just totally annihilated the number one CHR station in about a matter of maybe six months. They went from nothing to overtaking these guys, and it was all guerrilla warfare radio. T- I mean, they would show up at events and like with way more t-shirts and just tell all the, they, they had a contest where, in fact, we did it here at Sunny, uh, where we showed up at one of GRDs events one day and it was like a chili cook-off yeah and so the guys were there cooking but the radio station hadn't shown up yet we showed up and gave all, everybody we told everybody we'll give you a, you know 50 bucks if you just put on our t-shirts so everybody who was cooking chili put on our t-shirts we gave them 50 bucks and we left <laughs> and then grd shows up and they see all these sunny fm shirts yeah so that station down in tampa was doing all this guerrilla warfare stuff and they uh they bought like they'd buy like these jalopies and just spray paint all this weirdness on it and and so randy then bought a ton of radio stations okay he went crazy in fact he bought eight in cincinnati and then everybody went whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute you can't you can't have eight um and that was and so they they I think he was like seven or something was the well that was at, after he went yeah. he went nuts because he bought 13 in san diego eight okay. in denver he went nuts and then they said, "Okay, I thought, oh, hang on, it's got to, it can't be more than six or seven or whatever it was." But they left us grand, grandfathered in, so that's where the that was the beginning of the end. Because then all of a sudden they started thinking, "Wait a minute, you've got." We thought, "Oh, wait, eight stations, eight staffs, you all fight one another." Mm-hmm. And right away, when I got down there, the classic rock station I was working at, they put us into to a kind of a an area to protect. WEBN, the station they really wanted to make all the money because it was the cool one. So <laughs> we were we were a blocker station for that. So it was like it was like running a hundred yard dash, but you're only supposed to come in fifth because <laughs> these other guys have to win. Yeah. And then it just got progressively worse. Then JCOR was sold to Clear Channel. Then Clear Channel sold to iHeart. And then of course that whole iHeart thing when they sold it to Bain. In the investment, I mean, it was an investment investment group. Yeah, they don't want to run radio stations. Care, yeah. Well, that happened during the housing crisis, and they actually tried to get out of the deal because mm-hmm. they had bought they had bought the Clear Channel for twenty six billion, but after the 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 housing thing went through, it was only valued at like ten. Yeah. So now they have all this debt because they couldn't get out of the deal. They have all this debt, and they just started, you know kind of mushing everything together. I was virtually voice tracking six or seven other radio stations okay, at the so same that's time. that's how that all came about? That's how that came about. And we were blowing out midday people here and there and, and night guys all over the place. And then I could sit at my studio and I could voice track to Sandy. I could voice track anywhere. Right, right. Just, just, and you could see the log and you'd do your little thing and it would email it over in place and it would, you know, it'd, it'd match right up and it was, you know, perfect. It was scary how good it was. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, you know, it, <clears throat> the little radio show I do, I still do on Saturday. I do it all right here. Right. Yeah. And you that's. Know, I, don't, yes. I never. I never go there. Right. <laughs> I don't yeah. have to. And that's you know, and and that's that's one good thing yeah. about that is that you know now yeah. it's kind of flushed out by that. But the radio company then just decided it was all about you know saving the dollars. In fact, they let me go in January after 24 years. Um, we went from we had eight production directors because we had eight stations. Then we went down to. I think we went down to six radio stations because when we got sold, we had to give back to. Kept WKRP though, right? Uh, KRC. We haven't got, <laughs> there is no KRC. God, I wish there was a KRP. Um, well, Cincinnati. I mean, yes, you know. right. Well, and they uh, they knocked us down. There was three of us left and they blew out me and Dave Cudahy, who actually worked at Rock 101. Okay. I actually brought him down to Cincinnati huh. because of the experience that I had up here at, at Sunny and Rock 101. And uh, now they just have one guy. Wow. One guy. 
for yeah. eight for eight, for six stations. It, it happened with Muskegon too. It happened there the same yes. way. I mean, yeah, know, I think you guys. Mark, Mark Dixon was like the last one to right. go over there at uh, yeah. uh, Clear Channel or yeah. iHeart, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, over and yeah, and you're right because I think you're right. The smaller markets got. I think they got lamb basted way before. Right. We ever did. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I started, I remember starting at the, at the old East station and we were live and we did it until we transferred that. We even kept WKBZ way back in 80, well, it was 91 or 92. I remember that. Something like that. Mm -hmm. When when I automated it, that's when actually when Bart Frost was working there. Okay. And I, I was probably became program director and I was working on the AM side doing a live morning show, but it was a talk show. Which Mark didn't want anything to be part, you know, be okay. part of. He wanted to do the music, so he huh. did the FM side, which right. was ninety five three. Well, ratings came in, and the FM never did well, so his his ratings were down. So they told me, "Well, we're going to automate this." And it's like, what about Mark? <laughs> I had, I mean, Mark, I had a lot of respect for him, and you know, I didn't have to fire him, of course, you know, but it was just weird. It was just weird. It was, yeah. This yeah. whole thing has been just weird to see it in in its heyday and then to kind of watch it morph into where it's at now it, yeah. it kind of hurts yeah yeah, yeah. like i say and i was like one of the first in muskegon to try to to change the station over to a automated station okay i feel guilty almost <laughs> like i was i was the one for the condemning of radio you know, so. well yeah because i was also put in charge of the am when we turned it to all sports yeah and that was all automated Oh yeah. Um, there, it never had, you know, it never had a body in the first place, and uh, so I had so dealing with the automation systems. That was even, I even got a chance to kind of play around with that while I was at Sunny at the same time. So yeah, yeah there was just so many different things that uh, that station, you know, there I probably did just about everything you can think of. Yeah. And I don't know. It was just it was so it was just so weird that a, a place like that, you know, on this side of the state was there and then i actually got a chance to you know be a part of that just oh, a, yeah. just 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 mind-boggling oh, yeah. to me you know well, it's just like you know kbz on the am side you'll be talking about you know sports you know trying to do you know tiger baseball football uh local sports and, and you have to always have people to, to run them and half the people that i found were stoned half the time when they were <laughs> doing it and it was like, man, what a job. It was like, program director, I got this big name of program director. It's like, I don't want it. <laughs> you can have it back. I don't want it. And that's when I was working like 16 hours a day. You know, I got a divorce. Right. It was like, ah, I don't think this is, this is for me. <laughs> that was funny because I remember uh, at the, when we had the, the little AM station, I don't know how we got it, but we ended up with the, the hockey team. We could broadcast. Uh, the, we got we got the rights to broadcast oh, yeah. okay. uh, the Fury. Yeah. And so the person we hired to run the board was Joyce the Cleaning lady's son <laughs> oh Joyce I forgot about her yeah, yeah. and she some, which is funny she gave uh, my wife and I my wife actually uh, was Jennifer King who worked as a receptionist okay. at Sunny FM right. and Joyce the cleaning lady gave us for a wedding pre- present an indoor grill we still have that grill and it still <laughs> works but I remember at one, so at one point somebody had there had been a bunch of money that went missing there was I think it was up front I don't know why they had it out front but a bunch of money went missing a couple hundred bucks I think and Bob Goodrich uh, <laughs> sent down an edict that because they, nobody, we didn't find out exactly who did it, he said, you need to f- indiscriminately fire a third of your staff, is the way he put it. Okay. So um, Jim Richards comes to me, he says, hey, man, you got to fire a third of your staff. I go, I only got one guy. What am I going to, you know, what am I going to do? He goes, oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But yeah, that was Bob's solution to solving that problem was yeah. to fire a third of the program, of the part timers, I think. Everybody, I don't, everybody I don't loved Bob, but he was, he was a little different. Dude, <laughs> he Bob, was different. Wow. Bob, Bob would come in. And I don't know if you remember the production studio, but there was one wall that had all the dubs. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we had that kind of lined up in a system that would sort of self-purge itself. So we gave, everything got a number. And then when I filled up the whole wall, we would just start over again. And it, that usually lasted about six months. Okay. So everything would be, so I would just slowly remove six months worth of stuff. Bob would come in. 
you know, once or twice a, twice a week. He would check to see if all the light bulbs were okay. And if they weren't, he would automatically have everybody stop what they were doing and change light bulbs. And he would come into the production studio. And the first time he came in, he would ask me, he goes, so how, how long have these been here? And I go like, well, probably, some are probably been here, you know, like these are probably been here a couple of years because they're jingle packages and right. I need those. He goes, a couple of years, we don't keep anything that's over six months old. I want it out of here. And he grabs <laughs> a part-timer and a bunch of just a trash cans and started taking all the dubs and he put them all into the trash can and took them out back and threw them in the dumpster. The carts, you mean the 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 real the real the real the real real commercials, yeah, okay. which we used yeah. quite a bit. We'd have to go back to them all the time, and so I'm like, okay. So he left later that day. Guess what I was doing? I was in the dumpster, yeah. pulling all the dubs back out. And the next time he showed up and he asked me the same question, it was like, oh, those are just a week or two old. Yeah. Oh, okay, great, great, great. And he would just leave the studio. And I'm like, oh. yeah. I remember. <laughs> I, I was how would I remember to when we talked to Joe about that? Everybody got their own reel to reel that they had to use to, you know. Yep. Record all their phone calls or whatever, and we'd have them all diced and chopped and everything else. Oh, yeah. We had to keep using that same reel. That same one. Same yeah. reel. Yeah. And I remember trying to get new tapes for the four track recorder, and it was like, you know, pulling teeth. Oh, and yeah. That was just, I had, I think I had four that I would rotate through because I would just run everything on the four track. And then when the four track was full, I just pull the other one and just slowly record over top of whatever else was there. And then, and then I had a, what, two reel to reel machines. And that, I don't know if I ever got a new tape for those machines ever. Yeah. And there were times where I was splicing on the splices. It was just, you know, there was like layers of tape. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah, all over the, yeah, just well, pretty amazing. Wasn't Sunny like one of the first stations around there that had a four track? You know, I don't know. Um, Seems like it. I mean, it was a great studio. I mean, yeah, yeah. And, and I'll tell you about that, you know, when we're interviewing yeah, how yeah. that whole studio, that, that whole studio thing. Yeah, um, we probably should do that, huh? Because <laughs> <laughs> everybody hated Sunny. I mean, MUS hated Sunny. I didn't Sonny. realize that, KBZ yeah. KBZ hated Sunny. You could not say Sunny in the weather. I, mean, I do remember yeah, that. Yeah. I do remember that. Yeah, our, you know, Rock 95, I remember we, 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 we could not say sunny. It is sunny outside. No, it's just sunshine. There's sunshine outside. But you know, that's so weird to think that you guys, you know, because people used to ask us, we would show up at places, and if another radio station was nearby, I can't tell you how many listeners would come by and say, are you guys going to go over there and you guys going to fight? <laughs> What? No, I, I I don't know those guys, but I don't I don't dislike them. Um, but yeah, I had I had no idea. I thought everybody was having the same amount of fun we were, right? No, I just thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Oh yeah, man, you should have known that when you went over to MUS, like I did. Yeah. Now MUS, that was a culture shock. Yeah, that yeah. was that that's was that's that where was where I went from. Sunny was MUS. Was, oh. It was. I tell you what, though, it was the. I thought it was the most beautiful radio station oh, yeah. I ever worked at. I thought the way that thing was laid Wait, out. Jesse was the one that laid that one out yeah i thought that i thought when i walked in there i'm like oh this is look at that the listeners can see when you walk in there's a studio there's a newsroom the production studio right there the production director has his own office separate i mean look, this is unbelievable yeah. you know and it was just like wow yeah. just mind-boggling well i'm sure it had, you know tim had a lot to do with it too but i mean majeski's the one that you know put the whole all the studios together and everything so I'll tell you what's really funny do you remember how big those the speakers were in the production room oh yeah okay do you know that those actually do you know what was inside of them? No. Normal looking speakers. Were they? Yeah. It wasn't, they weren't, they weren't that big. Yeah. Cause I remember one day I'm standing in here and I'm They're like, They're still there. Are they? <laughs> yeah. I was looking, I was like, I've never heard of that, that number, you know, the, because yeah. it, like it had a weird number, like an EV something. Yeah. What is, so I like, you know, I pulled the front off and I'm, I'm seeing, okay, there's a, there's a huge, and I'm like, what, what that, but something doesn't look right. And then I went around to the back and there was a little, you could take, I actually took the thing apart and I looked inside. It was just a normal, it was a normal speaker that I put in that super large cabinet. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty cool. That's yeah. all right. That was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. But I thought it was, I thought that was the nicest radio station I'd ever, I ever worked at oh, until yeah. I got to Cincinnati. And when we moved in Cincinnati, we moved from one location to another. And then I had a studio on the sixth floor with full wind of windows from ceiling to that you know and it, it was all digital and everything like that that was but i just thought that was phenomenal because they even had sequencers on the on the board oh, yeah. you know you could yeah. push it. i remember i was just like whoa i don't have to push buttons anymore this could, is, you know. back when i smoked i could walk away for four or five songs <laughs> and have a cigarette and <laughs> that's awesome yeah yeah because yeah. they had nice little tones built in so they they got went to the next song and, and i was, and i watched it excruciating of how brian put those Brian would put, he would record, if he were, and I thought, God, you guys have the songs on cart? That's so bizarre. Yeah. Brian would record those onto the, onto the same cart. He would do it three times oh, before yeah. he was finally happy with it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, wow. 
Yeah. That guy was that guy was that guy was a, was was amazing. Yeah, was, and he's still there. And once I <laughs> and once I got him to loosen up, he was actually pretty cool. Yeah, he was oh, yeah. real tight at first, yeah. but yeah, he yeah, was. I like Brian. Yeah, Brian's a good guy, and he drives fast. You know that? I know. I never drove with him. I never drove with him either. <laughs> but he would tell me he where he lived and how he, he oh, would Grand get, Rapids. Yeah. yeah, and uh, there was no fa- he he was breaking the laws of physics because I, he must <laughs> he must have gone a bazillion miles an hour, and the car that he had at the time had more mileage on it. Yeah, but I didn't I didn't I didn't know a car could have three hundred eighty five thousand yeah. miles on it, and he and he. And he, I can't remember how long he said he, it didn't take him that long to get there either. Yeah. You know, like, you know, it was like maybe five years and he had just a ridiculous amount of miles. But I don't know if he ever went home because no. when I would get there, yeah. he'd be there. And when I left, he'd still be there. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if he ever actually did ever go home. Well, he slept on the floor quite a few times. <laughs> so that we know when I was there, he did. Yeah. It's like, somebody go wake up, Brian. I need to ask him a question. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brian lived and breathed that radio he station. Did. Yeah, he did. and he's still there. Oh yeah, Lynn Grant. Lynn Grant. Yeah, um, was I thought she was really, really talented. She's awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, and I would talk to her because I, I think I did a two-hour air shift. I think because I think I, I think I did it. I can't remember which was was even weirder doing country. Um, you know, as Ranger Bob, um, <laughs> it just didn't make any sense to me. But they wouldn't let—they wouldn't let me stop using the name. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think she came on, but she was so so good. But uh, what really interested me, she was miserable. I mean, yeah. She—I uh, don't know what was going on in her life, but I thought, gosh, you're working at a radio station. You're super duper talented, and you're not happy. And I was—I just couldn't. It couldn't. I couldn't process. Yeah. Um. Of, of that whole thing. And well, you know, her her trick was though, because she, you know, she told me she. I said, "What's your trick?" Because she always sounds so pleasant on the air when she was on. I mean, she sounded great. Yeah. And, but when she would talk to you, she'd had that country accent, which she didn't have on the air. Okay. But she had kind of a little country drawl. But she said, "You just put a big smile on your face when you go on the air," <laughs> which is funny because which is true, yeah. Which which was funny because after she was on the air, she wasn't smiling ever. I mean, if she was, uh, she was. I, I don't know. I'm, unless that was just a bad time in her life, I was. Oh, it could have been. Nick's I, I, yeah. I just remember. I just remember. I th- I think about that a lot. Yeah. Um. Of like, how could you possibly be at a radio station like this and not? Be thrilled and happy. You've got a neat little midday shift. Yeah. I mean, she didn't have to do any. I don't think she did any commercial work. No, I don't think so. Um, just came into the shift and. She and, could have. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, she, she had a great voice to yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah, but didn't have any. Um, I know I've run into people like that uh, a lot, where I've seen a ton of talent, and for some reason, the, uh, the 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 person just decides not to take advantage of it or, or to do something totally different. And I, that's always because uh, I've always had to work really super hard. Um, yeah. To be what I would consider good, and these other folks would be so talented, and they would just—they didn't even have to try, and it was just. Oh yeah, Britta. That's yeah, awesome. right. All of that. Now Britta. Yeah. yeah, and Britta was—I thought Britta was funny because she always—I remember in talking to her, she was always this close to being fired. Yeah. For like years. Yeah. And I thought, you know what? You've been telling me that for four years. And you're still here. I <laughs> just right. don't think you're going to be fired anytime soon. Yeah. I just don't she think it's going to happen. kids in and everything. I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it, that was fascinating. The, the dealing with the people, um, was, that was another, uh, another neat thing. Watching I, think every, I think every radio person, though, thought that they were not good enough to be there, though. And, and felt felt that they were... I, I, I guess, I, I mean, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's, I've, and I've always, not, I haven't been or very, they were too cocky and they were, well, I've run into those folks too, especially yeah. down in Cincinnati. When you get into a larger market, that's a whole different story where you've got people who are, you know, they are talented, they know they're talented and they're yeah. just, they're just ornery and mean. Um, but they're also very flawed. Um, yeah. The guy who did afternoons after me was probably the best classic rock DJ I had ever heard but he was a major prick. <laughs> God, was he a prick. Um, but it was fun to mess with him because, uh, you know. <laughs> you, you did that quite often. You oh, did that very well. Dude, we, yeah. that was, the, yeah, I mean, I, it, he just had to because it, it was just too fun. It was radio for crying out loud. Yeah. It's not brain surgery. Yeah. We're not saving lives. Yeah. I didn't think, you know, maybe um, we would. But, but there, did you have that moment, though, because you, um, when you went on the air for the very first time and kind of lost the whole... I'm on radio kind of thing. Did you ever feel that or you did? Okay. Oh yeah. At the beginning I did. Right. Um, but I, I would say by about, geez, maybe 91, 92, um, when I was at Sunny there, uh, cause I got there in 89. Um, I was really comfortable on the air. Yeah. 
and I was I was scary. I mean, I was like, I can't believe this. I'm actually kind of comfortable. I'm oh, kind of, yeah, yeah. you know, and I really enjoyed it. And I was really trying to get better. And, you know, I was just trying my best to get to get better and better and better because I always didn't think I was you know good enough and all of that. Um, but yeah, oh yeah. yeah. But there were, but yeah, oh yeah. A lot of times, in fact, when we talk a little bit, uh, my radio career went totally in a, a different direction than I thought I was going to go, and I forced it back into a direction that I wanted to go because of there's one major thing about radio that I don't like. Should we start this? Sure. Thinking? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Now you're still going, you still going by Ranger Bob then or what? Or well, I go by Mark, Mark Erickson. If, you know, if Ranger Bob works, it uh, don't matter that you, uh, that well, we'll, I, think, we'll I, I guess Ranger Bob, you know, is, is, is the way to go. I mean, if, if we want to throw, we can throw the real name out there, but I know, I don't know if anybody, cause I tell you, I can still walk into town and tell somebody I'm Ranger Bob. And they're, oh, dude, I remember you. And same thing in Cincinnati because I was six foot what? Four, six foot four. I yeah. mean, you're kind of hard not to recognize. Well, but a lot, of, uh, but I didn't do a, as many remotes and appearances as, as a lot of people did. So really? I didn't really, I didn't get out there as much as like the other guys did. I always thought you were out there with everything. Not, not as much as some other folks. Huh. But the name, and that's, and I'll explain, yeah. I'll explain to you the, how the name came about. But that the name is what stuck. And even down in Cincinnati, I was Ranger Bob for like. I think I was on the air for 12 years down there before I just went to commercial production. And, okay. And people are still, they still, oh, yeah. They even think I'm still on the air. Okay, we'll, we'll have to ask about that name. 